Well, this morning we're going to continue with our study in the book of Romans. I want to warn you before I read this passage, whenever I read the first 20 verses of Romans 3 to a congregation teaching it, I always see this glaze come across their face. Because Paul is writing in a very rabbinic way. It's a way that we don't think and process. It's it's just different for us. He's talking through an amanuensis. He's he's speaking, you know, uh, uh, in a very Jewish way. But when you break down these ideas... They have some very important truths in them. So uh, you, you have to concentrate a little bit because you know, this will be a little confusing, at least the reading of it. Hopefully the preaching of it won't be as confusing. <laughs> in Romans, the third chapter, I'm going to begin in verse 1 through verse 20. I'm using the New King James Version. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the prophet of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to His glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we, have been previ- for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks alike that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed bloodshed. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now this morning as we're continuing our study of Romans, the Apostle Paul is summing up everything that we've been talking about for the last four weeks. And he draws some conclusions. Imagine this first section of Romans as a courtroom case. Paul is the prosecuting attorney. He's making the case that everybody in the world has rebelled against God. So everybody needs a Savior. He's marshaled together all of his evidence to show that we're without excuse. Because that's true, we're all going to stand before God someday. And based on the evidence of our own lives, each one of us will be found individually responsible for our actions and therefore personally guilty. Paul paints the picture as black as the darkest night. The case against us, he says, is irrefutable. But there is hope because he offers us a Savior. Everything Paul says in these first three chapters is not to condemn us. It's to wake us up. He's trying to help us realize what our condition is, to stop lying to ourselves and fooling ourselves and to realize how important it is that we come to this saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now this Thursday is Thanksgiving and I thought about departing from our study of Romans to do a traditional Thanksgiving sermon today. But as I thought about it, I realized that what Paul is talking about All of our irrefutable guilt before God that we're saved 
from by Jesus Christ, being delivered from the guilt, d- delivered you know, from being eternally separated from God, which means being eternally separated from all that's good and all that's beautiful and all that's loving and all that's meaningful. That's the, real, that's the ultimate basis for a Christian's thanksgiving. You know, I doubt if for any of you that you would say t- 2020 has been the greatest year of your life. It's been a time of global pandemic, of terrible wildfires, his, historical history-making wildfires, more hurricanes uh, in this season than in any recorded season, fear, chaos, political turmoil. It's been a year that's been e- economically devastating for some people. Many people have lost a friend or a loved one to COVID-19. If our only reason for Thanksgiving this year is the material things, or our physical health and safety, we might be tempted not to be very thankful to just cancel the whole holiday like some state governors have suggested. But for those of us who have all the promises of God through Jesus Christ, that He offers to be our good shepherd, to care for us in life no matter what's going on around us, and then after the short 70 or 80 or 90 years we live on this earth to take us home with Him for the trillions and trillions of years of eternity. Now that's a reason to be thankful no matter what's going on. So in the section of Romans that we're going to look at this morning, Paul does what any good lawyer would do as he comes to the end of his case. He sums it up. When a lawyer comes to the conclusion of a case, he usually does three things. First, he tries to anticipate what are the questions that the jurors might have in their mind. And I want to answer those questions if I can. That's what Paul does in Romans 3, 1 through 9. Then in Romans 3, 10 through 18, Paul wants to bring in some additional supporting evidence. In this case, it's the evidence, testimonies, and quotations from the Old Testament. And then in Romans 3, 19 through 20, he's summarizing his conclusion and he's pushing for a verdict. So what are the questions Paul wants answered in his summary? There are five questions and five answers. The first question is about the Jews' uniqueness. Paul says in Romans 3, 1, What advantage is there then in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? Now you remember from last week, Paul has said, you know, Uh, that none of these things are going to get them to heaven, just being circumcised, just having the law of God. So Paul anticipates maybe some people are thinking, well, if being circumcised and keeping the law won't get you to heaven, what's the point of God ever telling us to do this? Is there any advantage if we're all guilty in being a Jew who strives to do what's right over just being a pagan who lives their life any way they like? And Paul's answer in verse 2 is, much in every way. It's a great privilege to have a Jewish or a Christian heritage. What's the advantage? Paul says, first of all, or chiefly, they have been entrusted with the very words of God, with the oracles of God. The Greek word for first of all or chiefly means of primary importance. When Paul says first of all or chiefly, it sounds like he's going to give a whole list of advantages of being a Jew, but he only gives one here. Why? He's saying the most important benefit or the primary benefit for the Jews is they were given God's truth, His teachings, His laws. We live in a society that was built on a Judeo-Christian foundation. You know, the, the pilgrims, uh, well, not much was made of it, but we're at the 400th celebration of the landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. The Mayflower Cl- Compact, which would, was the basis, you know, later for the, the, the democratic ideals that, that built this country. Uh, uh, we, don't, we don't always value that. Why do we live in the most prosperous country in the world. Why, although all the criticism of our country are people flocking to get in so that you need to build a wall, you know, to just keep everyone from pouring in. Why is that? Well, it's because of the foundation that our country was built on, the the foundation of God's truth. What specifically do you mean? Well, let let me get just real granular here. Before Before we knew anything about cholesterol and how bad it was for us, God gave the Jews a diet that if you followed that diet, it would protect you from cholesterol. 
Before we knew anything about hygiene, how illness was spread by microscopic germs and viruses, God gave the Jews rules about washing their hands, washing their bodies, cleaning their utensils. Before we knew how damaging mold was, you know, there were all kinds of regulations. If you get mold in your clothes, you destroy them. If you get mold in your house, you do this and you do that. And if it doesn't work and doesn't get rid of it, then you tear the house down. There are rules about crop rotation, you know. There are rules about how to have a strong family and a strong country. They're not just rules. They're God's truth. They're, God is showing them what's good and what's evil, what works, because nothing is unsuccess, as unsuccess, unsuccessful as evil. And so God's telling them, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. So God's laws are a treasure of truth, and anyone, if you're a pagan, if you're a Hindu, anyone who follows the truth of God as you read it in the Bible is going to have a better, healthier, and happier life. Now, later in Romans, in the ninth chapter, Paul's going to list other advantages of being a Jew. But in this summation, in Romans 3, Paul just focuses on the gift of God's Word, the gift of God's truth. They've been entrusted with the very words, with the very truths of God. The second question that Paul deals with is found in verse 3, and it deals with God's faithfulness. The question that Paul anticipates some may have is, does the Jews' unfaithfulness in following God's law cancel all God's promises to them? I mean, since the Jews didn't keep their part of the bargain, does that mean that God's going to give up on them and annul all of the promises that He made to them? And Paul's answer is found in verse 4. He says, not at all. Let God be true, though every man be a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right in your words and prevailing in your judging. When Paul says, not at all, the Greek expression he uses is may genotai. May it never be. It's a very strong negative. As a matter of fact, it's the strongest negative that you can have in the Greek language. Literally, it'd be like, no, 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 no. You know, God forbid, it's just impossible. It's the strongest negative. Paul uses it uh, 13 times in his writings, nine times in the book of Romans. He, he says, absolutely not. There's no way. God is faithful even when we aren't. God doesn't break His promises even when we do. In the Bible now, there are two kinds of promises. There are conditional promises and there are unconditional promises. Conditional promises are promises that say, if you do this, then I will do that. For instance, Jesus says, ask and it shall be given unto you. The condition is you have to ask. And if you ask, Jesus says, then it will be given unto you. There's another, you know, another example is whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The condition is you have to call on the name of the Lord. That's your part. And then you will be saved. That's God's part. 2 Chronicles 7.14 has been quoted a lot around this election time. It says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Now that's a powerful promise, but it has some important conditions. We have to humble ourselves. We have to repent uh, of our sins. We have to come to God in prayer. And then he says, if those conditions are met, then I will heal your land. There are many conditional promises in the Bible, but here, uh, but there are also many promises in the Bible that are unconditional, that are not based on what we do. And these are the promises that Paul is talking about in this particular passage. For instance, God promised the Jews that eventually they would have a Messiah. Now, did the Jews deserve a Messiah after they ignored God's prophets? Not only did they ignore them, they killed them. And they disobeyed God's law generation after generation after generation. Did they deserve a Messiah? No, they didn't. God, but God sent His Messiah anyway, just as He'd promised, even though God knew that for the most part, the majority of Jews were going to uh, reject the Messiah that God sent them. God still fulfilled His promise, and Jesus came into the world. So Paul is saying many of God's promises are based on His character, not based on my, mankind's performance. And aren't you thankful that that's true? A good example of this is found in Psalm 89, verses 30 through 37. It's a great example of God's faithfulness. There, the psalmist writes, If his sons, it's talking about David's sons, 
forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if, I, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commandments, I will punish their sin with a rod and their iniquity with floggings. But I will not take my love from him, from David, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. And his line will continue forever. How does it continue through Ever, through Jesus the Messiah who is in his line. And the throne, his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon of faithful witness in the sky. Jesus, the, the fact that he rules and reigns is a, is a faithful witness to the fact that God fulfills his promises. God is saying, even though the Jewish nation hasn't done what I told them to do, I still will fulfill the promises that I made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, those who were faithful. If you doubt God's faithfulness, just look at the nation of Israel today. How many other nations were scattered to the four winds and then regathered after, after 2,000 years of not existing as a nation? In 70 AD, the armies of Titus and Vespasian came. They destroyed Jerusalem. They burned the temple. They pulled down the walls of the temple. They pulled down the walls of the city. And every Jew that they could find, and that's the majority of them, they were either killed or they were deported all over the empire. But the prophets had said in the Old Testament 3,000 years before that a day would come when the Jews were scattered to the far corners of the world, even the islands of the sea, but the nations would bring them back to Israel. And in 1948, when the United Nations established Israel and countries from around the world sent the, you know, they helped pay for the Jews to return to Israel, it's exactly what happened. Never in the history of the world has a nation that hasn't existed for 2,000 years come back and existed once again. This is a sign of God's faithfulness. How could it happen? Because God is faithful. We see God's faithfulness demonstrated in the, the nation of Israel. That ought to be an encouragement to us because it shows that God's promises are absolutely trustworthy. You can count on them. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It may not happen on your timetable, but it's going to happen when God says it will happen. You can count on it. So Paul is saying God is still not through with Israel. He's working in and through the church to bring the message of salvation, but God still has a plan for the nation of Israel because he made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and many others throughout the ages, and he's going to fulfill those promises. This leads Paul to his third question that he anticipates that some may have. Paul's first question is about the Jews' uniqueness. Paul's second question deals with God's faithfulness. Paul's third question deals with God's righteousness. And this is one of the most difficult for us to understand because of the way it's written. Romans 3, 5 asks, But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing His wrath on us? This is one of the hardest passages in Romans to understand because Paul's trying to express some faulty human logic that's been used against him as he takes the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, the Living Bible makes it a little clear what Paul is saying because it's a transliteration that tries to capture the meaning of what's being said. But some say, and this is how they translate the passage, but some say our breaking faith with God is good. Our sins serve a good purpose. For, God will, for people will notice how good God is when they see how bad we are. Is it fair then for God to punish us when our sins are helping Him? That's the way some people talk, Paul says. Paul is saying there's some people that say, if our sin makes God look good and more gracious, why should we be judged for sinning? Why should we can be condemned when we're actually we're doing God a favor by being rebellious and sinful? And Paul says, what a twisted logic. It's like the guy who goes out and commits adultery over and over again, but his wife doesn't give up on him. She remains faithful to him. She doesn't divorce him. So he says to her, Honey, your faithfulness in the, faith, in the face of my unfaithfulness just shows the world what a great lady you are. But the affairs continue, and finally the man's wife has had enough. She's tired of all the philandering, and she says, This is it. I've given you every chance. The marriage is over. And the husband responds, that's not fair. I've just been acting this way to make you look good. 
Well, that's all a crock of baloney. And that's what Paul is responding to this insane logic of those who are looking to justify their sin by saying, well, our sin makes God look even better. Paul's answer in verse 6 is, may genotai, may it never be, certainly not. Is that the right way to think about it? If that were so, how could God judge the world? If sin is good, which it never is, then God couldn't judge anybody, even for the most horrible crimes against humanity, because everybody would be doing, uh, uh, be doing good every time they did bad, which is blatantly ridiculous. Which leads to Paul's fourth question, which is really just an extension of this third question. It's about God's truthfulness. Paul says in verse 7, Someone might argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases His glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Now this is just an extension of this ludicrous argument. Now Paul's an intellectual giant. And his response is to use what philosophers call, you take it to its logical, illogical conclusions. In other words, push it to the extreme and show how stupid the argument really is. So Paul says, why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. See, Paul preaches a gospel of God's grace that salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. And everywhere he's being followed by what we call today the Judaizers. They were supposedly Christians who came along and said, Jesus Christ plus you've got to become a Jew and be circumcised and practice the law. And Paul says, that's wrong. It's by grace alone. It's, that's how salvation comes. But these enemies of the gospel, they're, they're, preaching, they're saying Paul is preaching cheap grace. He doesn't want you to follow the law. He's saying you just believe the right things and that's... That's fine, but Paul says that's not what, that's a misrepresentation. Evil is always evil. No good comes out of evil. And he said God is going to judge evil wherever, it, wherever it's found. Now, unfortunately, there's some Christians who feel they can live that way today. You've got all kinds of people who feel like I can go on and live however I want to, you know, whatever lifestyle I want to, and as long as I believe the right things. You know, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm fine before God. It doesn't matter what some of these passages in the Bible says. And Paul says you don't want to go on sinning and sinning to prove how gracious God is because there are going to be consequences. Let's suppose you go to the doctor and you have a sore throat. And the doctor looks down your throat and he does a few tests and he says, yes, you have, a, you have an early case of strep throat, but don't worry, I've got a wonder drug. It's going to knock it out in no time. Now, how stupid would it be if you said, oh, well, why don't we wait, you know, a few, few days or maybe a week or two until it's just a raging strep throat, and then that will even prove what an amazing wonder drug you have. That, that's absolutely a ludicrous way to think about it. And yet that's what people want to do for God, to God sometimes. I've had people come to me, you know, and they've been in counseling and You know, and and finally, you know, they'll say to me, well, I know that what I'm doing is wrong. I know, you know, that God says I shouldn't go through with this divorce and marry my 22-year-old secretary and leave my wife and my three children, but that's what I'm going to do. And But, Pastor, you know ultimately God's going to forgive me. Well, if you're really a Christian, you know God will forgive you, you know, but what Paul is saying is, He's not telling people, you know, that there there are always consequences to these things. Throughout the ages, you've had Christians, you know, Constantine is a good example. He didn't want to, who don't want to be baptized until right before they die because they want to go on and live as much of a sinful life as they can for as long as they can. And then they hope at the last minute they have the opportunity, you know, to confess and be saved. So they say, well, I believe, but I just don't want to change the way I'm living my life. Paul says, don't presume on God's grace. You know, anytime you, you find, uh, you know, he, he preaches God's grace, but he wants them to know that there are consequences for evil that you do. And just coming to God, you know, uh, after you've de- deliberately done these evil, don't think that there are not going to be any consequences. Anytime you have someone who preaches and focuses on God's grace, you're going to have critics that come behind and say, you know, well, it's a cheap grace. It's not, he's, he's, he's leading people to sin. You remember Jesus was called a friend of prostitutes and sinners. 
because in the Pharisees' eye, he didn't follow all their strict rules as a way of salvation. Paul wants to make it clear, sin is bad because it hurts people. And because it hurts people, God is always going to judge it, and there's always going to be consequences to it. The good news is there's hope in Jesus Christ. Just don't take God's grace as a license to sin. In verse 8, Paul says, their condemnation is deserved. Condemnation, the consequences they face... You know, when I was a, a youth pastor years ago and later a hospital chaplain, uh, I met many young adults who'd done the very worst drugs of those days, the LSDs and, you know, the heroin, things like that in, in those days. And they, can't, they came to Christ. They really did. And they changed their life, you know, but the consequences that the LSD or the drugs it had on them, you know, on their bodies, the consequences continued. So Paul, you know, is saying, you know, God is no fool. Whatsoever a man sows, he's also going to reap. So the, their condemnation is justly deserved, he says in verse 8. Finally, Paul deals with one last question in verse 9. Paul's the prosecuting attorney. He's making his closing arguments and he says, what we sh sh shall we conclude then? Are we, the Jews, any better and he says, not at all. We have already made the charge that all Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. The last question deals with mankind's sinness. And, and Paul is just emphasizing again, are the Jews any better? Referring to his own countrymen. And he says, honestly, no. People are people and all of us are rebellious and sinful. You say, well, but didn't Paul say in verse Romans 3.1 that the Jews have an advantage? They've been given the truth of God, the law of God. Well, that's true, they have. And to the extent that they followed it, their lives are better. But just knowing the truth of God, they, they didn't follow it. They didn't keep it. He says, we're all rebellious sinners. We all need God's forgiveness. Just knowing the right things to do, if you don't do them, you know, then it, it doesn't profit you anything. Now, those are Paul's questions he deals with in his closing court argument that he's making against mankind. And he just packs them together, one, two, three, four, five. And until you break them down, it seems you wonder, well, where is he going with all this? But then, because he's speaking to a Jewish audience, after he answers what he anticipates may be their questions, I mean, a partially Jewish audience, he's writing to the church at Rome, in the next portion of the letter, Paul brings in supporting testimony from the Old Testament, from the Jews' holy book. In Romans 3, 10 through 18, Paul quotes five Old Testament passages. Now, these passages come from all different places in the Old Testament. And the way that Paul is teaching is the way the rabbis taught, a technique they called charaz. Charaz literally means, you know, uh, a stringing of pearls. What they would do is they would take a verse, a pearl, from this place in the Old Testament and that place in the Old Testament, and they'd bring them together and present an argument from Scripture, kind of like a biblical topical sermon. You know, one of the things that I've always done, I'll preach through a book of the Bible, and then the next series I do, I'll do a topical biblical sermon. I'll gather scriptures from all different books of the Bible. Maybe I'll talk about marriage or something like that to bring all the scriptures together. Well, that's what Paul does here in his sin. You know, sometimes people have said, well, the only biblical preaching is expository preaching. The only problem with that, I always say, well, show me that in the Bible because Paul never preached through the book of Daniel or any other book. But he does take scriptures from all over to show that Jesus is the Messiah to make his case. And, and in this case, in Romans 3, 10 through 18, we have Paul's topical sermon on sin. He has three points. Point one, it talks about man's character in verses 10 through 12. Point two, talks about man's, man's contact in verse 13 through 17. And point three, talks about the cause of sin in verse 18 through 20. So Paul is taking an x-ray of the human heart and mind looking through the scriptures and his diagnosis is going to be everybody's terminally ill. This is Paul's final indictment in these verses and he makes 14 statements but it doesn't take that long to go through, with, through them so don't panic. <laughs> Romans 3, 10 through 12 actually comes from Psalm 14, 1 through 3. Paul says, this is his stringing together of the pearls, his charaz, his rabbinic teaching from the Old Testament. 
He's quoting from Psalm 14, there is no one righteous, not even one. In other words, sin is universal. No one's perfect. All have sinned, all races, all religions, all nationalities. All of us have rebelled against our Creator. No one understands the psalm, and Paul goes on to say, no one seeks God. Now you think about that for a minute. Many people seek the things that God offers, but they don't seek God. Think about how it would hurt you if your children, your spouse, your friends, everyone you know, they didn't want anything to do with you. They just wanted what you could do for them. We don't long, for, we don't long to know God unless the Holy Spirit touches our heart and changes us. So Paul is saying, you didn't seek God, but He's seeking you. I don't know whether it came up this far north, but in the, in the south, years ago when I was in college in seminary, Elaine will remember this, they used to have bumper stickers that said, I found it. And I found it, you know, they meant they'd found Christ. They'd found the gospel. They'd found the truth. I, I found it. But if you were going to be theologically correct, the bumper sticker really should have said, he found me. Because there's no parable of the lost shepherd in the Bible. The Bible has a lot to say, though, about lost sheep. Jesus didn't say, I came to earth to be found. He said, I came to earth to seek and to save that which is lost. Who's doing the seeking? Paul's point is, it's not us that are doing the seeking. God is seeking us. And that's a real cause for thanksgiving. You know, he just doesn't give up on us. He just keeps seeking us, the hound of heaven. Secondly, Paul says, everybody's doing their own thing. In verse 12, and all have turned to their own way. Now, the Knox translation, which most of you don't know about, but it's a good old translation, everybody's taken the wrong course. They've all together become worthless, Paul says. And the word that he uses in Greek for worthless literally means soured milk. Most of you are old enough to remember when we used to take thermoses. Thermoses to school, thermoses to work, you know. You, and sometimes if you've ever taken a thermos of milk, and then you forgot it, left it in the car, or left it in your locker or someplace, and you open that up three or four days later, nothing, except maybe for rotten eggs, smells any worse than soured milk. And so Paul's point is worthless, sin, waste. Everybody's doing their own thing. All of us have turned our own way. It's like soured milk. We've all gone sour. Next, Paul talks about man's conduct. Verse 13 is a quote from Psalm 5, 9. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. So the next couple of verses, Paul's going to talk about our speech. Our speech gives our sinfulness away. When you go to the doctor, even today, one of the things the doctor will usually say with all the diagnostic tests that we have is, open your mouth and let me look down your throat, look at your tongue. And uh, that, that way he starts getting a quick diagnosis of what's going on with you. Well, God says, here, stick out your tongue. Let me see what you've been saying. Let me see what you've been talking about. I can tell about your spiritual health. The Bible says that what's inside of us comes out of our mouths. Out of the heart a man speaks, the Bible says. The poison of vipers is on their lips. That's a quote from Psalm 140, verse 3. The Living Bible says their tongues are loaded with lies. Everything they say has, a sting, has the sting and poison of deadly snakes. Vipers have a sack in the back of their mouth. It's filled with poison. You know, they can kill people with their mouth. Can human beings kill people with their mouth? Yes, we strike at each other with our words. That's what this cancel culture is all about today. Verse 14, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. That's from Psalm 10, 7. Paul's showing that the Bible says our speech shows our depravity. And if you want to see how depraved people are, just listen to the things they write and say with their social media. Then Paul starts describing our actions in verse 17. He moves from our throat and our lips and our tongue and our mouth to say their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and, ruin and misery mark their way, and the way of peace they do not know. That's all from Isaiah 59, verses 7 through 9. Mankind is violent, and as a result, our lives are filled with misery. They don't know peace, the Bible says. This would be a good verse for the cornerstone of the United Nations building, the way of peace they have not known. And finally, in verse 18, Paul gives the cause of our sin. He quotes Psalm 36, 1, because there is no fear of God before their eyes. The reason that we do our own thing, go our own way, is because we've just put God aside. You know, if you banish God from, from the public square, from public life, 
you get a disintegrating, disintegrating nation. You banish God from your life. You get, you know, a life that goes into a downward spiral. Paul starts with questions. Then he moves to Old Testament quotations to show that what he's teaching, that that's what God has been teaching, you know, throughout the ages. And finally, he comes to the conclusion in the last two verses, 19 and 20, summarize everything Paul's been building up to in these first three chapters of Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Paul says, summing it all up, I can tell you two things. One, the whole world is accountable. We're, we're, we're all going to be guilty. We're all going to stand before God someday. And the second thing, he says, the whole world is without excuse. He says, every mouth will be silent. I don't care how mouthy you are or other people are, on the judgment day, they're going to be speechless. They're not going to be able to defend themselves. You'll not be able to say, I'm innocent. Everyone's guilt is going to be so clear. The whole world's accountable. The whole world is without excuse. We're all helpless before God because we're all guilty. We've all sinned. But not only are we helpless before God, we're also hopeless without Christ. In verse 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Paul says no one's ever going to be able to say, well, I just did enough good things, you know, to save myself. Or I, I kept the Ten Commandments. Jesus makes it clear in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, if you lust for a woman, in God's eyes it's the same thing as committing adultery. It just, you didn't have the chance or you didn't have the courage but, you know, if you hate someone, the Bible says it's just like murdering them. And how many people today? And, and it comes into all of our hearts sometimes. I say, oh, you know, I hate Trump so much I want to kill him. I hate Nancy Pelosi. I hate Chuck Schumer. You know, and this hate, you know. Well, God would say that we're guilty then. You know, we just haven't had the opportunity or we might actually do it. But no one is going to save themselves. No one's going to be able to say that they kept the laws of God because none of us have. Then why did God give us the law? For two reasons. Paul says it makes us aware of sin. Through the law, we became conscious of sin. If you don't have a standard, you don't know when you fall short. If you don't have a goal, you, you, you know, if you have a goal, you know when you don't reach it. When you have a law, you know when you break it. The first purpose of the law is to make all of us aware, you know, of how far short we fall of the glory of God. God is perfect and we're not. You're never going to come into God's presence because you're good enough. The second purpose of the law is to point us to Christ. Paul talks more about this in Galatians, the third chapter, verses 23 and 24. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. The law imprisons people. It doesn't set people free. God's grace offered to us through Jesus Christ sets us free. Paul goes on to say in Galatians 3, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. That's the second purpose of the law, to point us to Christ. So that by trusting in Him instead of ourselves, we can be saved from certain judgment and destruction. Paul's whole point, once again, in all these chapters where he paints it so dark, we all need a Savior. It doesn't matter whether you're a respectable person, whether you're a religious person, whether you're a rebellious person. It's a total wipeout. We're all guilty. You may know the truth, but you don't do it. That's the bad news. But next week, we finally get into the good news. Between verse 20 and 21, J. Vernon McGee says that between these two verses, it's like the Grand Canyon. All of a sudden, Paul switches roles and he becomes the attorney for the defense. All of a sudden, we realize we don't have to live under judgment. We don't have to live under condemnation because as Romans 8, 1 says, there therefore is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the amazing good news. Next week, we're going to look at God's Christmas gift to you. It's going to be on Romans. We're going to be back in Romans. But then we're going to take, we're going to take a couple of weeks and we're going to talk about just specifically about Christmas. So I hope that you'll be here with us as we, uh, as we continue this service, Romans, and then as we go into Christian. But the ultimate reason for Thanksgiving this year, with all the difficult things we've faced, are the fact that Christ came into the world 
that He loves us, that He died for us, that He offers to forgive all your sins, to take care of you in this life and to take you into heaven, not because you're good enough, because none of us are good enough. And we beat ourselves up because we know that we're not good enough. And Paul says you need to stop beating yourself up. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Strive to live the way you know, but you, you don't do it by your willpower. You do it by God's great power. Walk in the Spirit, Paul says, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And God gives us a Spirit just the way He gave us salvation. And so we have a lot to be thankful for in Jesus Christ this year, no matter what the other things are that are going on in your life. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is honest with us. Most of us, Father, we deceive ourselves and we convince ourselves, well, I'm good enough. Father, but Paul holds up your holy word and your law to us. And he shows us, Father, that we're not what we should be and that we're deceiving ourselves if we think somehow we're just going to slip into heaven based on our own good works. Father, thank you for sending us a Savior. And on this Thanksgiving, as we thank you for the homes that we have and the food that we have to eat and the friends that we have and loved ones and our church family that I'm personally so thankful for, Father, help us to realize that ultimately what we have in Jesus Christ is so valuable that it completely over... It's like the sun coming up, Father. It completely overshadows every other light, every other blessing. Help us, Father to thank you not only for life and health and strength to go through each day, but also to thank you for all that we have in Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.